workers' blood shall run. There can be no power greater anywhere beneath the sun. Yet what force on earth is weaker than the feeble strength of one? But the union makes us strong. Solidarity forever. Solidarity forever. Solidarity forever. For the union makes us strong. It is we who plowed the prairies, built the cities where they trade, dug the mines and built the workshops, endless miles of railroad laid. Now we stand outcast and starving mid the wonders we have made, but the union makes us strong. Solidarity forever, solidarity forever, solidarity forever, for the union makes us strong. They have taken on Welcome to the For We Are Many podcast. My name is Rob. And my name is Trisha. And uh, thank you for joining us on our uh, part three. No, part four? Part, or part something? I think it's part four. I don't know. Uh, anyway, thank you for joining us on what I believe is part four of Emma Goldman's Anarchism and Other Essays. Um, we're going to continue using the same format that we've been using, uh, you know, where we'll be reading along, listening to the audio book, and we'll pause it and um, interject when we have something to add or, you know, uh, something to say whatever. Um, we posted about it yesterday, but if you haven't seen the post, thank you all for bearing with us. Um, we've both had kind of a lot going on in the last couple of weeks, and uh, last week we missed as many streams as we made, so um, just wanted to apologize to everybody for that and let you know that we're, we're trying to figure out how to move forward. Um, with a schedule that works for all of us. That being said, we're always willing to take on more help to help that situation. Um, but if that doesn't happen, then we might have to, you know, go down to three streams a week instead of four or, uh, something along those lines. Um, but we will keep you updated, obviously. And I hope you all join us tomorrow for our current event stream. We missed last week's and the week before that was the Star Trek Communist special. So there's kind of a lot to talk about. Indeed. Yeah, that's all I got. Right on. I guess you we summed it up pretty well. <laughs> I got nothing to add. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, do you want to jump right into the book, or is there anything you want? Do you want to like recap anything from chapter one, or? Um, no, it's all good. We can jump right into chapter two. <laughs> all right. Uh. Uh. Hold on, I don't want to skip that because, like, we're using their shit. This is a LibriVox recording. There we go. It has been edited, compiled, and distributed by Audible Anarchist. Part 2 Minorities versus Majorities from Anarchism and Other Essays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Anarchism and Other Essays by Emma Goldman Minorities versus Majorities If I were to give a summary of the tendency of our times, I would say quantity. The multitude, the mass spirit, dominates everywhere, destroying quality. 
Our entire life, production, politics, and education rests on quantity, on numbers. The worker who once took pride in the thoroughness and quality of his work has been replaced by brainless and competent automatons who turn out enormous quantities of things, valueless to themselves and generally injurious to the rest of mankind. Thus, quantity, instead of adding to life's comforts and peace, has merely increased man's burden. In politics, naught but quantity counts. In proportion to its increase, however, principles, ideals, justice, and uprightness are completely swamped by the array of numbers. In the struggle for supremacy, the various political parties outdo each other in trickery, deceit, cunning, and shady machinations, confident that the one who succeeds is sure to be hailed by the majority as the victor. That is the only God. Success. As to what expense, what terrible cost to character is of no moment. We have not far to go in search of proof to verify this sad fact. We still don't look, uh, have to look far to verify that sad fact. Sad fact. Uh, I can't talk. Um, and, and I mean, she said, never before did the corruption, the complete rottenness of our government stand so thoroughly exposed. Uh, never before were the American people brought face to face with the Judas nature of that political body. This was a hundred years ago. Things have certainly not gotten better for the working class in that time. Imagine what she would say now. This is kind of wild to think about. I, I mean, we always, like, when we're doing the Black Panther pieces, we always kind of talk about... Uh, you know, how little has really changed uh, given their situations. But, I mean, this is 40 years before that, and she's talking about a lot of the same things that we still see today. Right. That level of corruption has not changed, uh, it, except maybe, like, getting worse. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> Um, I, I guess that's really all I wanted to interject to say. Um, anyway, back to the text. Never before did the corruption, the complete rottenness of our government, stand so thoroughly exposed. Never before were the American people brought face to face with the Judas nature of that political body, which has claimed for years to be absolutely beyond reproach as the mainstay of our institutions, the true protector of the rights and liberties of the people. Yet when the crimes of that party became so brazen that even the blind could see them, it needed but to muster up its minions and its supremacy was assured. Thus, the very victims, duped, betrayed, outraged a hundred times, decided not against, but in favor of the victor. Bewildered, the few asked how could the majority betray the traditions of American liberty? Where was its judgment, its reasoning capacity? That is just it. The majority cannot reason. It has no judgment. Lacking utterly in originality and moral courage, the majority has always placed its destiny in the hands of others. Incapable of standing responsibilities, it has followed its leaders even unto destruction. Dr. Stockman was right. The most dangerous enemies of truth and justice in our midst are the compact majorities. The damned compact majority. Without ambition or initiative, the compact mass hates nothing so much as innovation. It has always opposed, condemned, and hounded the innovator, the pioneer of a new truth. And just to interject again, um, this again could be taken right out of today. 
Uh, the majority cannot reason. I mean, well, look around you. Um, the most dangerous enemies of truth and justice in our midst are the compact majorities. The, the compact mass hates nothing so much as innovation. All of these are true. Think about the, the mass like outrage that was going on in the right and even in some liberal circles during Black Lives Matter. Look at the, the mass hate towards women's rights movements, especially in you know right-wing governed states like Florida or Texas. Anyway. One of the things where it's like how how the fuck has ignorance itself become so prevalent to be the majority? People who want to regress back to the 1950s thinking that was the good old days. And it's like, uh, no. Like that point in time might have been great if you were white and wealthy. But for everyone else, it fucking sucked. But that's the type of shit that we're dealing with when we want to make any type of progress at all is the MAGA motherfuckers. Yeah, and, and I mean, that's the thing. Like, so-called populist candidates that are that are often really just fascists in disguise like Trump, That's that's what they feed on. Yeah. That compact mass, the compact majority, however you want to word it, it's still a problem today. It's probably a bigger problem today, I would tend to think. Um, yeah, because, I mean, look at how ingrained the entire right wing has gotten with all of the shit that led to their even being a Trump presidency. Like, okay, this shit who, you know, can't even properly quote the Bible when asked what his favorite book was and he's like, two Corinthians, it's second, okay? I'm not even a fucking Christian, I can tell you. It's second Corinthians, not two Corinthians. But he literally duped all these people into voting for him by exploiting the fucking evangelical TV shit and, you know, so many of them are just abhorrently fucking right wing and wealthy and racist in the whole fucking nine yards that they pushed for this motherfucker to get put in place. That was a huge part of his voting block was people going, we need a good Christian in office. And it's like, no, we need religion left the fuck out of politics. That was a huge influencing factor because along with that, you know, comes also the sexism. I mean, look at how many MAGA women were out there saying that women shouldn't have the right to vote, that their husband should be voting for the whole household. Like, shut the fuck up and sit down. You don't speak for anybody but yourself. <laughs> right. Right, it's absolutely. Like regression instead of progression. Sad. Agreed. Um, back to the text. The oft-repeated slogan of our time is, among all politicians, the socialists included, that ours is an era of individualism, of the minority. Only those who do not probe beneath the surface might be led to entertain this view. Have not the few accumulated the wealth of the world? Are they not the masters, the absolute kings of the situation? Their success, however, is due not to individualism, but to the inertia, the cravenness, the utter submission of the mass. The latter wants but to be dominated, to be led, to be coerced. As to individualism, at no time in human history did it have less chance of expression, less opportunity to assert itself in a normal, healthy manner. The individual educator imbued with honesty of purpose, the artist or writer of... So what she's describing is what we now have a term for modern day. It's called fucking tokenism. Yeah. Because... Motherfuckers will be like, what do you mean? Minorities have 
all the representation and same rights as everybody else. Look here, here, there's, there's a woman who is successful in this career field. Look, there's a black person who is successful in that career field. So we already have equality. What, what are you out here demanding equality? Oh, the fuck we don't, because if women had equality, we wouldn't some other fuck all over this. If black people, brown people, red people had actual equality, still have a for programs to, you know, white people. The fact that corporations still have to be to not only hire white people is precisely why we need to actually keep pushing for things like that that only recently started with the civil rights movement even enacting any in the workplace for any types of minorities for fuck's sake it was only a few months ago that we actually got legislation passed to prevent people from discriminating against lgbtq when it comes to hiring practices so yeah. No, this is not an era of the minority. As much as the big would like to fucking holler at the top of their lungs because they feel threatened not being at the fucking pinnacle of every fucking thing, like, no, we do not have equality yet. Agreed. Uh, leading back into the <clears throat> the next line, I don't know exactly where it cut off, but the beginning of the next line was the individual educator imbued with honesty of purpose. I think that's about where it was. Of original ideas. The artist or writer of original ideas. There we go. The independent scientist or explorer, the non-compromising pioneers of social changes, are daily pushed to the wall by men whose learning and creative ability have become decrepit with age. Educators of Farrar's type are nowhere tolerated, while the dietitians of predigested food, a la Professors Elliot and Butler, are the successful perpetuators of an age of non-entities of automatons. In the literary and dramatic world, the Humphrey Wards and Clyde Fitches are the idols of the mass, while but few know or appreciate the beauty and genius of an Emerson, Thoreau, Whitman, an Ibsen, a Hoffman, a Butler, Yeats, or a Stephen Phillips. They are like solitary stars, far beyond the horizon of the multitude. Publishers, theatrical managers, and critics ask not for the quality inherent in creative art, but will it meet with a good sale? Will it suit the palate of the people? Alas, this palate is like dumping ground. It relishes anything that needs no mental mastication. As a result, the mediocre, the ordinary, the commonplace represents the chief literary output. Need I say that in art we are confronted with the same sad facts? One has but to inspect our parks and thoroughfares to realize the hideousness and vulgarity of the art manufacture. Certainly none but a majority taste would tolerate such an outrage on art. False in conception and barbarous in execution, the statuary that infests American cities has as much relation to true art as a totem to a Michelangelo. Yet that is the only art that succeeds. The true artistic genius who will not cater to accepted notions, who exercises originality and strives to be true to life, leads an obscure and wretched existence. His work may some day become the fad of the mob, but not until his heart's blood had been exhausted, not until the pathfinder has ceased to be, and a throng of an idealless and visionless mob has done to death the heritage of the master. We still see this today, uh, not, not just in art in the traditional sense, um, but, but look at music. I mean, it doesn't matter what kind of genre you listen to. If you're listening to mainstream music, it all sounds the fucking same. It's all the same four chords and the same recycled melodies and the same 
uh, lyrical themes used over and over and over and over. Right, like, like it's there's some same shit being recycled. Exactly. And I mean, as much as I respect the Beatles for changing the face of music, I mean, it kind of all started with them. They figured out that four chord formula and now everybody uses it. And everybody's still ripping off their fucking vocal melodies and lyrical themes. And that's, been, that's the 60 half years. ones. Then there's completely talentless ones who have entire songs that are just, oh no, oh no, oh no, oh no, oh no. And I'm like, that's not fucking lyrics. Looking at you, TikTok, and the 50,000 fucking oh no, oh no, oh no, oh no fucking videos. And I'm like, oh no, if I hear this song again, I'm going to fucking scream. Lack of creativity. The creativity's gone. The innovation's gone. And the majority of what you see being kicked out to the masses. You got to go underground anymore to find anything that has any kind of actual innovative qualities and any lyrical content. Agreed. Um, so I want to read the first couple lines of this next paragraph. And then let the audiobook repeat it to drive it home. It is said that the artist of today, which, keep in mind, this was written, you know, somewhere around 100 years ago. <laughs> it is said that the artist of today cannot create because Prometheus-like, he is bound to the rock of economic necessity. It is said that the artist of today cannot create because Prometheus-like, he is bound to the rock of economic necessity. This, however, is true of art in all ages. Michelangelo was dependent on his patron saint no less than the sculptor or painter of today, except that the art connoisseurs of those days were far away from the madding crowd. They felt honored to be permitted to worship at the shrine of the master. The art protector of our time knows but one criterion, one value, the dollar. He is not concerned about the quality of any great work, but in the quantity of dollars his purchase implies. Thus the financier in Mirbeau's Les Affaires sont les Affaires points to some blurred arrangement in color, saying, See how great it is? It costs 50,000 francs. Just like our own parvenus, the fabulous figures paid for their great art discoveries must make up for the poverty of their taste. The most unpardonable sin in society is independence of thought. That this should be so terribly apparent in a country whose symbol is democracy is very significant of the tremendous power of the majority. Wendell Phillips said fifty years ago, In our country of absolute democratic equality, public opinion is not only omnipotent, it is omnipresent. There is no refuge from its tyranny. There is no hiding from its reach. And the result is that if you take the old Greek lantern and go about to seek among a hundred, you will not find a single American who has not, or who does not fancy at least he has, something to gain or lose in his ambition, his social life or business, from the good opinion and the votes of those around him. And the consequence is that instead of being a mass of individuals, each one fearlessly blurting out his own conviction, as a nation compared to other nations, we are a mass of cowards. More than any other people, we are afraid of each other. Evidently, we have not advanced very far from the condition that confronted Wendell Phillips. Today, So, uh, many, or sorry, not many, more than any other people, we are afraid of each other. It's still true. And probably to an even greater degree at this point. Right. And, and I mean, you know, like, they have a very good point um, 
about the masses in, in this in this nation. I mean, we're so divided. Divided. We're always fighting each other over stupid shit. Um, and public opinion. I mean, think about how liberals at protests, for example, use public opinion as an excuse for everything. Oh, well, we can't, we can't defend ourselves from the police because what will the public opinion be? That's fucking sad, too. Because I mean, well, right, but I mean, we we even saw that in Occupy. And we, right. we even and saw that in Occupy, and we, we had people try to come to our general assemblies and complain about the quote-unquote violence that had been shown at other occupations, and it's just like, yo, 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 hold the fuck on. <laughs> like, they didn't right. even start the violence. They were defending themselves. Right, and that's pretty sad when even people who were within the movement didn't want to recognize that of, like, <laughs> wait a minute. Our people Le- just got liberals, man. and defended oh, themselves. Oh, well, what about what about public opinion? What about public opinion? What about public opinion? This is how much public opinion means to me. What matters to me is, did they survive it? Because most of the time, that's going to take fighting back to actually live through it. Agreed. Oh. I know something else I need to add to the list for the current event stream. Kyle Rittenhouse. Oh, there's an update on that asshole? I mean, it's not much of an update, to be honest. But he went to court. Yeah. And and that's what I want to talk about in that stream. Is uh, what the judge would and would not allow to be admitted into evidence. And, you know, why we act like a justice system where a judge can make those decisions uh, is a justice system at all. Right. But, yeah. I'll save my rest of the, the, the rest of my rant on that for tomorrow. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, back to the text. Back to the text. <laughs> Day as then. Public opinion is the omnipresent tyrant. Today, as then, the majority represents a mass of cowards willing to accept him who mirrors its own soul and mind poverty. That accounts for the unprecedented rise of a man like Roosevelt. He embodies the very worst element of mob psychology. A politician, he knows that the majority cares little for ideals or integrity. What it craves is display. It matters not whether that be a dog show, a prize fight, the lynching of a nigger, the rounding up of some petty offender, the marriage exposition of an heiress, or the acrobatic stunts of an ex-president. The more hideous the mental contortions, the greater the delight and bravos of the mass. Thus poor in ideals and vulgar of soul, Roosevelt continues to be the man of the hour. I would assume that she's referring to FDR. I don't remember exactly when this uh, essay was written. Hold on. That's why I paused it. But I would assume that she's talking about FDR, and that's what I want to. No. No, I don't think that it would have been. Yeah, 1910. She's talking about Teddy Roosevelt. Yeah. Which, I mean, I guess really kind of makes sense if you think about it. He was certainly a warmonger. He did some good. I'm not trying to, like, take away from that. I mean, but saying that he's better than other U.S. presidents is setting the bar extremely low. He did do a lot of good conservation work, but he was also, for a fact, a warmonger. Trisha, I just saw your lips move, but I didn't hear anything. Are you muted? I forgot about that. I was just agreeing with you. No, gotcha. Indeed. Yep. 
but yeah, I mean, actually, like, eventually I would like to do, like, a leftist analysis of Teddy Roosevelt, because there are some, some decent things that he did that we can, like, learn from and build on, but there's also a lot of shit that he did that needs to be talked about and not just swept under the rug. Right. Um, but yeah. I will say that I agree with Teddy Roosevelt pretty much entirely on conservation, but you know, that's a lot different than how you treat your fellow man, I guess. Right. She was critiquing him as a human being right there. Yeah. Foreign ideals and vulgar of soul. Yeah. And I mean, I can only imagine like what kind of pedestal they put him on then, because I mean, now we're well over a century later and we still, you know, like, well, not we as in like you and I, but I mean, actually, like I considered myself a fan of both Roosevelt's until fairly recently, actually, like, you know, doing back research and, and, and seeing how they responded to labor movements, which I, I mean, not to say that either of them were entirely anti-labor, but they were both very much pro-capitalist. Right. And that's um, a good one. <laughs> exactly. It's one of those things is like, you're not taught in school the whole fucking story. You're only taught the shit that they can whitewash and shine and fucking, you know, make it look like, see how awesome this person was? And that's because they're only telling you a fraction of the fucking story. When really, I mean, if you look at our line of presidents, it's like, wait a fucking minute, because so many of them had horrendous ethical failings. Oh, yeah. It's like, I, I'm I'm to the point where it's like using the word our to describe them feels awkward and uncomfortable for me because it's like, I'd, I don't claim those motherfuckers. They were U.S. presidents. They were never my president. Yeah. They're horrible fucking people. Yeah, I, I mean, I agree. <clears throat> All right, well. Uh, Back to her verbal tongue lashing here. I, I like it. I love what that mouth do. <laughs> <laughs> Critique capital. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Indeed. And capitalists. Indeed. On the other hand, men towering high above such political pygmies, men of refinement, of culture, of ability, are jeered into silence as mollycoddles. It is absurd to claim that ours is the era of individualism. Ours is merely a more poignant repetition of the phenomenon of all history. Every effort for progress, for enlightenment, for science, for religious, political, and economic liberty emanates from the minority and not from the mass. Today, as ever, the few are misunderstood, hounded, imprisoned, tortured, and killed. The principle of brotherhood expounded by the agitator of Nazareth preserved mm -hmm. the germ of life, of truth and justice, so long as it was the beacon light of the few. The moment the majority seized upon it, that great principle became a shibboleth and harbinger of blood and fire, spreading suffering and disaster. The attack on the omnipotence of Rome was like a sunrise amid the darkness of the night. Only so long as it was made by the colossus figures of a Huss, a Calvin, or a Luther. Yet when the mass joined in the procession against the Catholic monster, it was no less cruel, no less bloodthirsty than its enemy. Woe to the heretics, to the minority who would not bow to its dicta. After infinite zeal, endurance, and sacrifice, the human mind is at last free from the religious phantom. The minority has gone on in pursuit of new conquests, and the majority is lagging behind. 
handicapped by truth grown false with age. Politically, the human race would still be in the most absolute slavery were it not for the John Balls, the Watt Tylers, the Tells, the innumerable individual giants who fought inch by inch against the power of kings and tyrants. But for individual pioneers, the world would have never been shaken to its very roots by that tremendous wave, the French Revolution. Great events are usually preceded by apparently small things. Thus the eloquence and fire of Camille de Moulin was like a trumpet before Jericho, raising to the ground that emblem of torture, of abuse, of horror, the Bastille. Always, at every period, the few were the banner-bearers of a great idea, of liberating effort. Not so the mass, the leaden weight of which does not let it move. The truth of this is borne out in Russia with greater force than elsewhere. Thousands of lives have already been consumed by that bloody regime, yet the monster on the throne is not appeased. How is such a thing possible, when ideas, culture, literature, when the deepest and finest emotions groan under the iron yoke? The majority... That compact, immobile, drowsy mass, the Russian peasant, after a century of struggle, of sacrifice, of untold misery, still believes that the rope which strangles the man with the white hands, i.e. the intellectuals, brings luck. In the American struggle for liberty, the majority was no less of a stumbling block. Until this very day, the ideas of Jefferson, of Patrick Henry, of Thomas Paine are denied and sold by their posterity. The so I, I wanted to interject here and actually, like, say, um, well, fuck Jefferson, first of all. Patrick, Patrick Henry was okay, and Thomas Paine actually is one of the few founders that seemed to grow after the American Revolution and keep expanding his ideas. I mean, I, I don't necessarily think of, well, Thomas Paine was some sort of leftist, but Patrick Henry, I don't, I think he was more of a liberal. And then Jefferson, I mean, can we really take anything that he says about, about uh, freedom seriously when he owned slaves? Not just owned, but raped and impregnated. Right. right. He himself um, was of mixed heritage and did everything he could to hide that fact, including destroying letters written by his mom. Um, if I remember correctly, I believe his mom was half black, half white, and his dad half Native American, half white. I'd have to look it up again, but I, I think that was the case. And he did everything in his power to try to conceal that. So... That right there is an ethical failure when it comes to anything else that he has to say when it comes to racial and ethnic equality. Or any kind of equality, really. Um, right. But yeah, I mean, out of those three, if you're going to read a founding father, at least make it Thomas Paine and please go deeper than common sense. I mean, not to say that common sense was all bad, but he still had a lot to learn at that point. Right. But, uh, yeah, anyway, back to the text. The mass wants none of them. The greatness and courage worshipped in Lincoln have been forgotten in the men who created the background for the panorama of that time. The true patron saints of the black men were represented in that handful of fighters in Boston. Lloyd Garrison, Wendell Phillips, Thoreau, Margaret Fuller, and Theodore Parker, whose great courage and sturdiness culminated in that somber giant John Brown. Just going to interject one more time to reiterate. The greatness and courage worshipped in Lincoln have been forgotten in the men who created the background for the panorama of that time. The true patron saints of the black men were represented in that handful of fighters in Boston. Lloyd Garrison, Wendell Phillips, Thoreau, Margaret Fuller, Theodore Parker, 
and of course, John Brown. Not to mention, you know, the slaves that, that, that joined John Brown to fight for their freedom. Um, which I, I, I feel like is something that she really missed in pointing out. Like, there were, there were thousands of slaves that did their part in winning their freedom. Right. Like, yes, John was showing up ready to kill some slavers. But he also was asking those people to join with him and help him continue that and go to the next farm and free their slaves and keep going. Yep. Yep. This, you know. And I mean, there are some names on there that I don't recognize, but the ones that I do recognize are white. So I have no reason to assume that any of the other ones are not. You know, right. like, and I'm not even necessarily blaming her for that. Again, look at the era and, and look at how much misinformation there still is today, uh, you know, pertaining to, to, well, I mean, fuck to the, to the cause of the civil war for that matter. It's still a debate for some fucking reason. Right. Um, so, I, I mean, you know, I'm not trying to say that she, like, willfully excluded anybody or that she was trying to do, like, a white savior thing. Um, I don't think that was her intention at all. It was just very well-known names that were at that, you know, event in Boston. So... ones that everyone would have known who they were but yes she right could have taken the opportunity to mention the literal thousands of freed slaves yeah who fought that battle right on anywho yeah. anywho <laughs> yeah. their untiring zeal their eloquence and perseverance undermined the stronghold of the southern lords Lincoln and his minions followed only when abolition had become a practical issue recognized as such by all. About fifty years ago, a meteor-like idea made its appearance on the social horizon of the world, an idea so far-reaching, so revolutionary, so all-embracing as to spread terror in the hearts of tyrants everywhere. On the other hand, that idea was a harbinger of joy, of cheer, of hope to the millions. The pioneers knew the difficulties in their way. They knew the opposition, the persecution, the hardships that would meet them. But proud and unafraid, they started on their march onward, ever onward. Now that idea has become a popular slogan. Almost everyone is a socialist today. The rich man as well as his poor victim. The upholders of law and authority as well as their unfortunate culprits the free thinker as well as the perpetuator of religious falsehoods, the fashionable lady as well as the shirtwaist girl. Why not? Now that the truth of fifty years ago has become a lie, now that it has been clipped of all its youthful imagination and been robbed of its vigor, its strength, its revolutionary ideal, why not? Now that it is no longer a beautiful vision, but a practical, workable scheme, resting on the will of the majority, why not? With the same political cunning and shrewdness, the mass is petted, pampered, cheated daily. Its praise is being sung in many keys. The poor majority, the outraged, the abused, the giant majority, if only it would follow us. Who has not heard this litany before? Who does not know this never-varying refrain of all politicians? That the mass bleeds, that it is being robbed and exploited, I know as well as our vote-baiters. But I insist that not the handful of parasites, but the mass itself is responsible for this horrible state of affairs. It clings to its masters, loves the whip, and is the first to cry crucify the moment a protesting voice is raised against the sacredness of capitalistic authority or any other decayed institution. Holy shit, does this not sound like today? Yeah. Relatable. Yeah. Um, 
the, the masses ultimately are responsible for our horrible state of affairs. We cling to the, the, the power systems. We cling to our electoral system. We cling to the employer-employee relationship. We're the first to point our fingers at uh, protesters. We, obviously, in this case, is referring to the American public. Uh, but, I mean, like, look at the, the calls by the right today to plow into crowds of left-wing protesters. Right. And, you know, you can always find their fellow megas out there, like, cheering them on, too. Like, yeah, man, that's what you should do. And it's like, no, that's not. How is it okay for you to murder someone because you feel inconvenienced by protest traffic? Or you feel insulted because you're a racist piece of shit. You don't get to just kill somebody for, I don't know, using their words and expressing their, you know, absolute right to protest. But that's the type of shit we see because they're like, oh, fuck, you threaten this system that was set up to benefit me. I get to kill you for that now, right? Uh, no. <laughs> like, I don't know what the fuck is wrong with people who think like that. I think it's really okay to just drive their fucking car into a crowd and kill people. Yeah. And I mean, like, you know, back in Occupy, we heard, like, well, read, I guess, social media comments about things like that, you know, like back when they were shutting the highways down in Oakland and Portland. I mean, we, we read these kind of comments all the time. And it was right. kind of, I mean, don't get me wrong, it pissed everybody off, which is exactly what they wanted. But at the time, I don't think any of us thought that 10 years down the road, that was going to be a regular occurrence. Right. Like, how is this becoming a trend? Right. There's so many fucking bigots out there that just feel empowered to do some shit like that because again that public opinion thing when mostly what you're hearing is more parroting of the same fucking shit coming from other bigots because they happen to be a huge majority group in this fucking country really think that what they're doing is fucking justified and their likelihood of actually getting a jury of their peers is pretty good Versus you or I getting a jury of our peers, not so fucking much. Any leftist getting a jury of your peers, not so fucking much. So, you know, they, they just feel like I can do this and I'll get away with it anyways. Yeah. Oh. You know, what's it going to take and, you know, when it comes to defending oneself, if somebody comes plowing their fucking car into, you know, a crowd of protesters, like there was some video that I saw a few months ago of precisely that happening and a woman was instantly fucking killed. And there was literally people there arguing over how to handle the fucking person driving that vehicle of, you know, a few people wanted to, like, end that motherfucker right then and there, and rightfully so, like, you're a fucking murderer, fuck your shit. And other people were going, well, wait, no, we have to just detain him and, you know, wait for the cops to show up, and they'll handle it, you know? Like, how much do you really count on them to make sure that is properly prosecuted? I mean, that being said, I'm kind of glad... And maybe this is for selfish reasons, but I'm kind of glad that it didn't go the other way because we all know. And I was just bitching it, about the, would have been the court opinion of, thing. Yep. Would have been the court of public opinion going, look, see. Exactly. They, they, they wouldn't see it as fucking self-defense of putting a stop to someone who feels entitled to just go murder people with their car. They would right. have seen it as scary leftist outrage. It would have been more red scare propaganda. Exactly. Exactly, and I'm thankful that it didn't become that. Although I still would have supported him if it did. <laughs> I'm I'm at the point of frustration with the whole situation that 
I'm looking at this like maybe that's the response that needs to happen. And these motherfuckers would think twice about doing it. I look at it no differently than um, cutting this dick off. Make the others who want to fucking do that too fucking scared to do it when they're aware of what the consequences will be. Yep. Propaganda of the deed. Propaganda of the deed. There we go. Yep. Um, so I'm going to read this next line and then I'm going to let this reread it again just to drive it home. Yet how long would authority and private property exist if not for the willingness of the mass to become soldiers, policemen, jailers, and hangmen. Yep. I, I mean, it's a perfectly valid point. Yep. Yet how long would authority and private property exist if not for the willingness of the mass to become soldiers, policemen, jailers, and hangmen? The socialist demagogues know that as well as I, but they maintain the myth of the virtues of the majority because their very scheme of life means the perpetuation of power. And how could the latter be acquired without numbers? Yes, power, authority, coercion, and dependence rest on the mass. But never freedom, never the free unfoldment of the individual, never the birth of a free society. Not because I do not feel with the oppressed, the disinherited of the earth. Not because I do not know the shame, the horror, the indignity of the lives the people lead. Do I repudiate the majority as a creative force for good? Oh, no, no. But because I know so well that as a compact mass it has never stood for justice or equality. It has suppressed the human voice, subdued the human spirit, chained the human body. As a mass, its aim has always been to make life uniform, gray, and monotonous as the desert. As a mass, it will always be the annihilator of individuality, a free initiative of originality. I therefore believe with Emerson that the masses are crude, lame, pernicious in their demands and influence, and need not to be flattered, but to be schooled. I wish not to concede anything to them, but to drill, divide, and break them up, and draw individuals out of them. Masses. The calamity are the masses. I do not wish any mass at all, but honest men only, lovely, sweet, accomplished women only. In other words, the living vital truth of social and economic well-being will become a reality only through the zeal, courage, the non-compromising determination of intelligent minorities, and not through the mass. This has been a LibriVox recording. It was edited, compiled, and distributed by Audible Anarchist. Yeah, so um, that's the end of chapter two. Um, I mean, honestly, I agree with what she's saying about the masses, but it's not like dissuading me from Marxist, Leninist, or socialist ideology at all. Uh, and in fact, I, I think that the vanguard is the best hope of pushing that, that envelope of, of leading humanity in the right direction. Um, I don't know, that's just my two cents on it. I agree with what she's saying, but I still am not completely moved to her outcome. But again, I mean, I think that we need to learn not just from, you know, an anarchist or a communist. We need to learn from everybody on the left that's come before us. There's, you know, a solid 150 years of class struggle that's been well documented as a science. I, I, I mean, right. there's a whole lot to learn from. Um, and I, I, out of the anarchist stuff that I have read, I find myself disagreeing with Emma Goldman less than I expected to. <laughs> um, uh, I disagree with her very seldomly. Um, right. And it's usually over, and, you know, like that, 
that distinction of the role of the state that we talked about in the state and revolution piece last Wednesday, uh, which we still got to get posted on our own platforms. I, he never sent me the, the, the recording. Okay, we got to touch base with him then. Yeah, I actually just now thought of that. Um, but yeah, anyway, um, we had this conversation in that. Um, you know, about the, the very small distinction of of what the role of the state is. A uh, 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 central versus decentral or federal type setup and well uh, I mean I don't know there's a lot of discussion that could happen on that distinction on its own but the point is though is that I completely disagree with her I, I mean not disagree I completely agree with her on the, the masses versus the minorities there um, the beautiful parts of society do come from the minorities Especially right. here in the U.S. Everything is so whitewashed here, and I think that's a big part of what she was getting at. Yeah, specifically, because the masses that she was calling out in this are the same ones that we're calling out today, which is the white, wealthy, male-driven aspects of power in this society. Or, I mean, you know, as MLK put it, the white moderate. Yeah. That too. I mean, now that there's a whole lot of moderates left, everybody's kind of, you know, right wing or extreme right wing. Right. The ones that are moderate are now called progressives and they pretend to be on the left. And it's like, yeah, no, you haven't reached the left yet because you're still in favor of capitalism. Yeah. And I mean, it's not even fundamentally changing capitalism. I, I, I could give somebody a chance if they were trying to fun fundamentally change the way that capitalism operates. And, you know, like, there was a movement behind them on top of that, I guess. But that's, that's not the case. We don't have that kind of social democratic party here. In fact, nowhere really does anymore. I mean, the, the social democratic party might be you know, one of the oldest uh, active parties in Germany, and they might have been in power when their current constitution was written. But what have they used that social democracy for? They still haven't seized the means of production. Right. They do have better health benefits and shit, though. Well, and education, I mean, yes. But, yeah. I, I mean, even still, like, the... And, and I'm not trying to, like, advocate for this because it still comes at the expense of the global south, but, like, the Scav the Scandinavian model is, is better than Germany's model. Yeah. And, and, I mean, honestly, the Scandinavian countries, like, if they didn't exploit the global south to be in the situations they are, I could totally get behind that. But we don't need more colonization. We need to undo the colonization that's already been done. We don't need more right. imperialism. We need to undo the damage that we've done uh, geopolitically around the world. Agreed. Um, there are so many fucking areas like that still have colonizations happening from England, for example, you know, and it's like, it's 2021. How about you relinquish these people's lands back to them? Right. Get your people the fuck back home. Quit trying to go into other place and tell them how the fuck to live according to how much you can exploit them. Right. Uh, so next week's piece is going to be on chapter three, uh, which is titled The Psychology of Political Violence. And, and I mean, that might be a difficult thing to discuss. Like, 
Well, I mean, I guess probably not so much because it's just you and I, and I think that we're going to understand a lot of the things that she's getting at here, but we might actually, like, get some backlash for our comments on Chapter 3. <laughs> That's okay. I'm up for it. Um, but, yeah, so, I mean, just to, to clarify, the audiobook for Chapter 2 was 20 minutes long. And we're at an hour. Chapter 3 is 52 minutes long. So we're looking at at least a two hour piece. Okay. Yeah. Um, I mean, assuming that we have as much to say. I mean, to be fair, it could be like, preach. Instead of actually like discussing the topics. But, um, I mean, I guess I'll give like a sneak preview. Because this... this First, this first paragraph, honestly, kind of sums up, I guess, what I was just trying to put into it, in, into words. Uh, to analyze the psychology of political violence is not only extremely difficult, but also very dangerous. If such acts are treated with understanding, one is immediately accused of eulogizing them. If, on the other hand, uh, human sympathy is expressed with the at attentator, I don't know if I pronounced that right, but probably not. <laughs> one risks being considered a possible accomplice. Yet it is only intelligence and sympathy that can bring us closer to the source of human suffering and teach us the ultimate way out of it. So, I, I mean, that lays out right there. There's going to be a lot to unpack there, and that's why it's so, such a long essay, ultimately. Um, but an important one, really. Right. That's going to be a fun dive. We'll definitely yeah. have to start that one a little earlier in the evening. <laughs> well, yeah, for sure. Um, so, yeah, I guess to wrap things up, um, I'm not totally sure what all pieces we're going to do this week, um, but obviously we have tonight's. Tomorrow we're going to have our current event stream and... Uh, well, either way, Zach is going to do his State and Revolution stream, even if both of us miss it. But I don't think both of us are going to miss it. I'm sure one or the other. If if not both of us, one or the other will be there. Um, but I'm not making any promises on the Black Panther Party piece or the historical piece for this week. Just so everybody knows right now at the beginning of the week instead of um, at the end of the week. <laughs> right. But, uh, yeah, join us tomorrow, 8 Eastern, um, 5 Mountain Standard Time for my Arizona comrades. Um, yeah, there's there's quite a bit to discuss. We haven't had a current event stream, in, uh, a regular current event stream in September yet, and tomorrow's the 20th. <laughs> um, or 21st, well, I mean, tomorrow is the 20th because we pre-recorded this, but you get the point. The stream is the 21st. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. Yeah. I confused myself there so bad. Anyway, point is, it's been two weeks. We have a lot of things to, to catch up on. Um, that being said, I don't want to have like a four hour current event stream or <laughs> anything like that. Um, those days, thankfully, seem to be behind us. But just for a sneak preview of what kind of things we'll be talking about, uh, the AOC dress, um, we'll, we'll give our critique and spin on that tomorrow. Vaccine mandates. This I'm just going to go right out and say it. We're all anti-authority. Anti-authority doesn't mean anti-information or anti-science or anti-doctor or anti-healthcare industry. Um, and, and I mean, like, do I have concerns about vaccine mandates being overreaching? Yes. Yes, I do. But given the current situation of vaccine misinformation and all around selfish 
refusal to get the vaccines, what other option is being given? What other meaningful option is being given? Um, so, yeah, I mean, I'm sure that'll be much. There's a lot of uproar about this, but, you know, the same group of people who wants to say that it's a bigot's prerogative to not make a cake for a gay wedding want to now complain about it being the employer or employee. Yeah. The employer's prerogative to require you to have a vaccine to work there. And we're talking about like people are bitching about this requirement being at hospitals even of like, how dare you require doctors and nurses to get vaccinated? Guess what? They always have been, you know, um, this is just one more vaccine being added to that list of what's required because it's for the safety of all the staff and the patients, you know, things like that. Like, yeah, your employer, the hospital, for example, has that right to expect you to be vaccinated against certain things for health and safety measures. It's, it's not out of line or out of order in any fucking way, shape or fashion. This is just... It's not safe for you to work in that environment if you're not. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then probably the first thing I, I think that I want to kick off to, uh, yeah, tomorrow's stream with um, Occupy, honestly. Uh, we're going to rag on ourselves for being old because it's been 10 years. But right. we're going to reminisce on the movement. You know, like in retrospect, because hindsight's always twenty twenty. what we could have done better, what we did achieve. Uh, and I want to make it a point to read the list of demands and break down why they're crucial to building a better world. I don't think there's a single demand on there that isn't important. Um, and, and that would, of course, be the list of demands that was ratified, I believe, in November of 2011 by the Occupy Wall Street. General Assembly, um, and, and it was ratified by most fucking encampments that were still there. Um, I, I don't have like a definitive list on, on what occupations ratified it and which ones didn't, but most did. Um, and then 9-11, I mean, obviously that's, that's a little bit behind by, you know, 10 days or so, but we didn't, we didn't do the one on the 14th. So we have 20 years of oppression to talk about, you know, right. like the, the effects it's had on the American people, the Afghani people, the American economy. And of course the world's opium supply. I can't forget that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And, and I mean, I actually have a piece, uh, that we're going to talk about. Um, there was a drone strike in Kabul, uh, and the Department of Defense admitted in a press conference uh, Friday that the deadly drone strike in Kabul had killed at least 10 civilians, including up to seven children. Uh, yeah. yeah. We'll be talking about Kyle Rittenhouse. Not a whole lot of an update, um, but we're going to remind everybody why he's going to court because, I mean... The way that the, the way that it's been exactly the way that it's been portrayed, I, I feel like is really watering down what happened. And um, on top of that, I, I want to talk about what kind of things the judge is not allowing to be admitted to evidence, or specifically is allowing to be admitted into evidence. And why the hell is that a judge's decision? When it comes to shit like that, it really shouldn't be. It, like, who are they to disallow evidence? Right. The jury and needs to hear all of the evidence, not just what the judge likes. Exactly. Exactly. And I'm hoping that us and other people like us are all saying the same thing and trying to push that envelope because that's, it's not okay. It's not fucking okay. And I mean, you know, they're still like touting that the defense is calling it self-defense, but they're not really talking no. about the gravity of the situation. It's murder on behalf of a window. Yep. He was, he yep. was defending windows. 
Yep. Um, and then the the only other thing that I know for sure. Well, actually, no. There's two more things. Uh, this is also from a World Socialist website. Beijing condemned the military pact between the U.S., Britain, and Australia. Um, they essentially are concerned that this is going to turn into a new Cold War. And I feel like the State Department has been beating those drums since Hillary Clinton was Secretary of State. In, in terms of a new Cold War with communist China. And boy, how history loves to repeat itself. Speaking of history repeating itself, Louisiana residents are blaming government failure and neglect following Hurricane Ida. Uh, this was a significant problem after Katrina as well. FEMA responded too little too late. Um, and there, there was a lot of shit, frankly, uh, following Katrina that, that was just mishandled, uh, to put it bluntly. So, uh, we're, we're kind of seeing some, we're, we're kind of seeing that happen all over again. And this piece was written by the staff of Liberation News, which is the propaganda arm of the party for socialism and liberation. Um, so, you know, like at least this, this article is already lit, written from a Marxist Leninist standpoint. So at least we don't have to like, you know, decipher it and put our own spin on it because, well, I mean, our own spin should be pretty damn similar to what their spin is. Right. Um, but I mean, I, I guess we will see when we really start like breaking it down. Um, Yeah. Also, this uh, to circle back this U.S. Britain Australia thing um, that that is, I believe, designed to put pressure on China. Uh, these these preparations for war began all the way back under President Obama. They were expanded under Trump, and now, well, I mean, now it's an official pact under the Biden administration. And if that doesn't show you that there's not a goddamn difference, I don't know what will. Yeah. Both the Democrats and the Republicans are right wing. Two heads. And they're imperialists and colonizers. And yep. <laughs> yep. That's about all I got, though. Um, do you have anything else you want to add, or should we work on wrapping this up? Let's wrap this up. <laughs> Indeed. Don't need to blow the whole load about the uh, current event stream right now. <laughs> well, no, and I mean, there's going to be other things that we're talking about besides those things as well, but those are some big things that I, I you know, if anybody's watching this stream and hasn't tuned into a current event stream yet, you know, like we never really talk about like what we talk about during the streams on other streams. So I was just trying to see if maybe talking about it might maybe. build interest in it, but we'll see. Right. Grab some attention and like, Oh, Hey, there's other shit we talk about besides theory. Yes. <laughs> yes, there is. Um, all right. Well, that's all I got. So I will uh, let this fade out, I guess. All right, uh, have a good night, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you tomorrow. My camera's not mirrored, so I'm like, oh, wait, wrong way, moving it. Yeah. <laughs> right. It happens.